Good morning, friends. Welcome to uh, Shepherd of the Hills United Methodist Church. So glad you are here today to worship together as we uh, form ourselves into uh, yet another iteration of what it means to be the people of God. We're glad that you're here. Those of you online, we welcome you as well. Glad you're a part of our worshiping community. If you want to turn and wave to them, they love to see not only uh, the backs of your heads, but also your, your smiles and your eyes. So it is good that God has invited us to this place and this time, and we trust that God has something special for each of us. During our worship service today, um, it's the second Sunday of Easter. Last week was uh, uh, Easter Sunday, of course, and so we gather in this Easter season now to think about, pray about, listen for what God might be telling us about what it means to be an Easter people and how the resurrection changes our lives and influences who we are and what we do together. Um, we will be celebrating communion today, and we want to, before, uh, don't want to forget it later on, uh, want to let especially visitors know that all are welcome to be part of our communion service here, that uh, uh, even if you don't have a membership here or anywhere, if you are moved to join with us and receive communion, you are welcome at this table. We consider it the Lord's table, and so um, Jesus invites you to be part of, of his table and to receive communion. Um, it feels like there's something else I need to say, but I can't remember what it is, so I'll invite Doug Bays to come. Doug is the chair of the, is that the right name? That is the right name. Chair of the Staff Parish Relations Committee. I've called him Randy a number of times, and so he has an announcement for us. Good morning. With Pastor Joyce retiring, which is a great celebration for her, we, um, as SPRC chair, I, I'm up here representing SPRC chair, uh, we have to um, adjust Pastor Derek's compensation package. And so as part of that, we have to have a church conference to do that. Normally, if you've heard church conference, we normally do those in November. That's when we approve pastor's compensation, uh, elect lay delegates and delegation and uh, other connectional giving. And so anytime you make a change to a pastor's compensation package, you have to have a church salary. And so, or uh, let's see, compensation package, you have to have a church conference. Sorry. Thank you. So anyways, I, we have set this up with pastor, or with dist, uh, district superintendent Lou Ward. He will be here on April 28th at 5 p.m. So it's a Sunday evening. 5 p.m. three weeks from today. And so uh, we invite you to the church conference uh, to participate and vote in that. With that said, on April 21st, in two weeks, right after this service, I don't know who's doing the service that week. Do we know? Gail Hadwick-Davis. Gail's doing the service. Right after that service, we're going to hold a question and answer session. So everybody can understand, ask questions, so we can make our church conference move along pretty quickly because the DS is driving down and going to drive right back, I think. So um, trying to accommodate his situation. So we are going to have a question and answer session April 21st, right after this service, and then church conference will be April 28th at 5 p.m. So uh, there are SPRC members, uh, Carol and Emily, I know, I, I see Barbara, um, uh, Joan, and I don't, is Karen here? Uh, anyways, we, uh, we can answer questions, but we'd like to do it all in one question and answer session after uh, service on the 21st. So thank you all. Appreciate your time. morning. I know your bulletin is saying that uh, the vivacious and beautiful uh, Pat Evers will be here, but I'm her late-minute substitute, and 
I noticed Doug is back there with his rotten tomatoes and cucumbers and so on, in case I don't do it correctly. Would you please stand for the call to worship as you're able? It is good for God's people to gather together in unity. We are here at the invitation of God. In this place, God's love and grace flow into our lives. In this place, God's blessings abound. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. If you remain, remain standing now for the hymn of praise, number 308, Thine Be the Glory. like to invite the kids to come and join me right here in the front for a picnic. So I'm going to set up a picnic. All right, we got to have space for a picnic, right? Okay, so let's see. I'm going to set out my, my, my picnic blanket. It's short, but I bet we can all get around it. Does that look okay? Does that look okay? Okay, all right. So that's usually what I think of with a picnic, is a picnic blanket or something like that. And uh, so I want to I want to talk about a picnic today. So uh, I want to ask you, where where is your favorite place for a picnic? That's like eating outside. Do you have a favorite place? Where's your favorite place? Outside? I love it, too. Where's your favorite place? My room. Your room? Ah, oh, that sounds like an awesome picnic spot. Do you have a favorite place for a picnic? In your backyard? Oh, it sounds great. What about your favorite place? 
the park. Yeah. How about you, Isabel? Do you have a favorite spot for a picnic? She's getting help with remembering. Well, I brought some snacks. Yeah, to share. Do you have a favorite spot, either one of you, for a picnic? At the fire pit. Oh, that would be an and your fire pit, too. It sounds like an awesome place for a picnic. What am, like at the fireplace? That's a wonderful place, especially if you like marshmallows in your picnic. I, uh, one of my favorite places was at a swimming pool with my grandparents. So I would go swimming, and when I come back, my grandparents would have, have things cooking, and they'd have things out of their picnic basket and stuff. So what I want to share with you is, for this picnic... I want to share about, uh, with you about a picnic that Jesus made for his, for his friends. So here's the story. Can you focus? Look at me. I can see you. Well, I'm going to give you some. Yeah. So here's the story. So the story is that when Jesus, last week we celebrated a very special day. Remember what the day was? Easter. Easter, yes. And with Easter, we have... Um, Jesus said, you can't see me now, but I'm going to go back home. And so some of his friends did go back home to where they, they had lived and shared together. And so when they went back home, some of them didn't see Jesus, but Jesus knew where they were. And so Jesus said, or so his friends said, I don't see Jesus and I'm feeling sad. What can we do? I know we go fishing. We know how to go fishing in the lake. So they went fishing. And when Jesus saw them fishing. He said, I'm going to do something special for them. I'm going to make a picnic. So, so when they're fishing, he, he calls out and everything was ready. He made them for breakfast. It's a breakfast picnic. He made them fish. Anybody have fish for breakfast? Have you ever? I eat waffles. Waffles. All right. I think I'd like that better than fish. But Jesus made fish and, and uh, bread for their picnic. And so he had everything ready, and then he calls out to them, they're fishing, and they says, hey, friends, what you doing? And they didn't know who it was, and he said, we're fishing. Are you catching any fish? No. He said, well, throw your nets on that side of the boat. And then they caught tons of fish. And they said, who is this guy over there telling us how to fish? And they looked, and he's waving, and they realized it's our friend Jesus. And, they, and one of them, Peter, got so excited, instead of rowing the boat like the other guys were and staying dry, Peter jumped out of the boat, and he's swimming and swimming and swimming. He could not even wait. Would any of you jump out of a boat like that? No. You would, yeah, yeah. Would. You, you would too? There was Jesus. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, I can't wait. You guys are rowing too slow. So I thought for this, I brought... I brought, since it's, I think it's important to ask your parents if it's okay to share, but I thought in memory of this wonderful story about Jesus, I brought, yes, it's from the Bible. We can find it, and you can even ask your parents to show you where it is in the Bible. It's an awesome story. So what I brought is, to help us remember this, this story, what is this? Goldfish. It's goldfish. It's fish, just like Jesus made fish, but the fish, would, are they real fish? No. That's right. What are they made out of? Cracker. They're like a cracker, like a bread. So you got in this, you have fish and you have bread. Crackers are bright bread at the same time. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to share with you this breakfast, this breakfast picnic. And since picnics are best when they're shared, I want to give each one of you a bag. One for you and one to share with someone, just like Jesus shared his breakfast. So I'm going to give this one for you and one to share. And you've got to think about who you might want to share the other whole bag with. <laughs> whole bag. One whole bag for you and one whole bag for a Friend, you think about who that friend is going to be. And here's one, Isabel, here's one bag for you and one bag to share. 
okay, well, that's good. You can, you can share them with someone else if you want. Okay, and I want to give you one to share and one to keep for yourself. And I just want us to remember that Jesus loves being friends with all of us. And we share that love and friendship with others in his name. Shall we have a prayer before you go back to wherever you like to go back to? All right, don't open them up. I want you to ask your family first if it's okay. It's okay with me if you eat them at your seat, but only with your parents' permission, okay? All right, let us pray. Oh, God, it, Easter is so special, and we remember how you came to us again and again in so many different wonderful ways, including having a breakfast by the sea. How cool is that? We love that you are friends with us. Help us to be friends with all your, your friends all the people you love as well. Amen. 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 Thank you all for sharing this fun little picnic with me today. I have more fish. So afterwards, be happy to share it with you. Let me ask you, I know we have others in this congregation who have had fish for breakfast. How many have had fish for breakfast? Fresh caught fish? I wouldn't be surprised, some of you having fresh caught fish for breakfast. For us, it would be fish sticks, I think. We'd have to have some help with that fresh caught fish. Well, today I want us to, uh, to re remember once again that... Um, that God places on our hearts those people who um, are like last week as I used the image of uh, the Easter stone in front of the, the Easter grave. And uh, sometimes there are people in our lives who bear the heaviness, like the weight of that stone um, before a grave and wondering how they're going to move the stones of their difficulties and, and struggles and, and things that they need some courage uh, to have in their lives. How are they going to move that? And uh, we, we remember them in prayer. And so uh, you have the, the insert, which is uh, kind of orange looking today. And uh, please remember them and uh, hold them in your hands and your hearts as you pray for each person. And, and we do receive, we've received two new uh, prayer requests this week. So please uh, keep an eye open for those opportunities for caring and sharing uh, your bread and fish with others. I will lead us in our prayer, and which will um, include this prayer of yearning, and then I'll invite you at to join me in uh, the Lord's Prayer after the pastoral prayer as printed in your bulletin and on the screen. May the Lord be with you. Let us pray the prayer of yearning. God of grace and mercy, we want to continue singing the Alleluia's of Easter, but there are days we just don't feel like singing. Sometimes we lock ourselves away, fearful of what has happened or what the day may bring. Sometimes we allow our doubts to overwhelm our faith. Sometimes we forget about the needs of our neighbors because we are so focused on ourselves. Forgive us. Draw us back to you and to one another. Help us to walk in your love and light that others may see in us the loving presence of the risen Christ. Amen.
Oh, Lord, on this Easter season, we welcome you into our lives in fresh and new ways. We welcome your resurrection, for it is life-changing, life-giving, life-sustaining. We welcome the hope it brings to our world. We welcome the joy it brings to our darkness. We welcome the empty tomb, for we know what it means that you are in this world unrestrained. As we pray for our world and for those in our circle of care, may your resurrection give life to those who feel lifeless, those who are just going through the motions, those who have had experienced the death of a loved one and are remembering with sadness and grief and, and joy as well. Lord, may your resurrection give hope to those who are mired in despair and those who have given up on hope. Lord, may your resurrection give joy to those who feel no joy, who have lost their joy or have had, or have had their joy snuffed out for some reason. And God, we give you thanks for goodness, for the ways that you show up and you seek us out in those unexpected places, even in a breakfast by the sea, offering joy and peace and hope and new directions and assurance. Lord, may you be on the loose in this world as our risen one, our Savior, our Redeemer. May we receive your prevenient, justifying, sanctifying grace as we walk our journey of faith. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to uh, see if we can remember our witness, our phrase of witness from last week. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And I'm still... Go back, I, I'll, I'll never unhear that again, Miss Gale, when you said to us last week, that works so much better here than it does at the grocery store. <laughs> but perhaps it is at the grocery store, and it is at the ballparks, and it is um, all those places beyond these walls where we, uh, we offer our testimony to how Christ is working in our lives. We offer um, to the world our, uh, our witness to know that we are not alone, that the risen Christ walks with us. And uh, so here is those opportunities for this week, one of many opportunities that God gives us, but ways that we can share our testimony this week. And so um, I want you uh, to remind us that this week that United Women of Faith are meeting this Wednesday for their monthly meeting at, on the 10th, 1230 and. Uh, uh, you, in the fellowship hall, bring a sack lunch if you'd like. Uh, remember, Jesus met people around the table, and so uh, we'll meet each other around the table and, and share. Um, also, on Wednesday the 10th, we'll be cooking and serving at the first switch point dinner of the month. And uh, go back to that. I didn't want us to forget that other piece about the switch point. The next opportunity will be Thursday, April 18th. So make a note of that. And, uh, and Randy Sane is here. Here he is. If anyone has any questions, in, including how do you get started doing this wonderful ministry, Randy is your person. Uh, I want to double check uh, Gloria. They, people do have an opportunity to... Outstanding. So... Um, there is a Tri Church Women's Luncheon, and uh, this is this came about in part because uh, 
we women in this faith community love to get together and grow our faith and be in a, a sisterhood of faith. And uh, we started talking a, a year ago about, well, what would it be it, to have a retreat together? And we realized there wouldn't be a venue big enough to hold everyone who would be interested. And so as a result, there is an opportunity to gather for a long re four-hour retreat-like experience around a dinner, mixers, a fun program. I know I'm giving the program. It'll be on the Holy Spirit as a wild goose, which is in the Celtic tradition, and uh, lots of fun things that you will, uh, you will learn and, and people you will get to know. So today is the deadline. Gloria has shared gloriously that there are over 60 people already signed up for this. If you are not one of those 60, sign up today. See Gloria. It's going to be a blast. And then Coffee Talk in Fellowship, um, Doug Bays reminded us this morning and he was getting ready for coffee and he spilled some on his shirt. He, he said, I sacrificed a shirt for coffee. So, as he was being our servant. So, so uh, once again, let's gather around those tables. That's where the risen Christ meets us, as we see in all those incidences. Gather together and meet one another and, and get to know someone that you don't know yet, or check in with someone you do know. And now I would uh, turn to Ernie as he leads us in this morning's offering. Will the ushers please come forward for the morning offering? And please fill out the attendance pads and pass them on and then back to the center after you're finished.
abundant God, we are grateful for all your blessings, especially for the presence of the risen Christ. Bless these gifts that they may help bring your love and light into our community and our world. Amen. In standing for the reading of the word, our scripture today is from John 20, verses 19 through 31, which is found on page 108 of your New Testament Bibles. I would say before, today's reading is post-resurrection, when Mary tells the disciples that she has seen Jesus, and he's left the tomb, and the disciples first see him. And when they see him, it's in a locked room. He greeted them with peace and his blessing for them to receive the Holy Spirit. And most importantly, he charged them with the task of going out into the world and delivering his message that faith in God may give people everlasting life. So to begin on verse 19, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put a finger in the mark of the nails in my hand on his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answers him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to them, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. God. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds together be acceptable in your sight. May your word for us this day come through. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, friends, we gather once more. It is a week since Easter. There is much that has changed. We've, the tomb is gone, which we didn't need anyway because it was empty, right? The choir and the, 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 the chancel choir, the bell choir, they've all vanished as well, like the tomb. They're risen as well, perhaps? Um, flowers and decorations, there's not going to be, there wasn't a, there's not a lunch or a breakfast as there was last week, and so um, we're a week out from the Easter miracle. So the question might be asked, has anything changed?
Is the world a different place because of Easter? What about your life? Did you walk through your world any differently this week because of Jesus having been raised? Mark was a parishioner in a previous congregation I served many years ago. He was in his mid-60s and was anticipating retirement very soon. I think it was within a few weeks or maybe a month. And he came to me one day in my office, wanting the, to talk about the changes he was anticipating in his life and how lost he was feeling. No one seemed to understand how frightened he was of retirement, including his spouse. Where others saw opportunity for newness and refreshment, Mark saw an abyss, a cliff over which he was about to go. He could see couldn't envision any future for himself. His identity had been so wrapped up in his work that he could not imagine any sort of meaningful life beyond retirement. Questions were swirling around. Would he still be somebody of any worth if he was not going to work, to be productive every day? And what I remember most about that particular visit was his eyes. As he sat across the desk from me, his eyes were empty, pleading, lost, searching. But for what? I believe what Mark was looking for and needing at that time was a connection. A connection with another living, breathing human being who might understand what he was going through. Someone to say to him, not only through words, but also through presence and touch, that his life mattered. That he was important. Him, just himself, not his job, not a role that he took on, nothing, in fact, about what he did or didn't do. Mark simply needed to know that he was an important person just because of who he was. In this morning's scripture from the Gospel of John, the first part you notice taking place the evening of that first Easter, the second part happening a week later, the disciples are gathered together in a house, in a room, and it is locked. It is locked, you noticed, out of fear. I believe it would be fair to assume that there was a lot going on inside of their heads as well as inside of their hearts. This is just two days after Jesus was crucified, after an emotional week, and now there are rumors about Jesus being alive. What would have been swirling in their minds? I would suggest a few things. Hope that Jesus may just be risen as the empty tomb seemed to suggest. Could it be true? Grief. Certainly there would have been grief for whatever else may have happened. They saw Jesus die on Friday afternoon. Anger. Certainly they would have felt anger at Judas, certainly, 
At the religious authorities? Yes. At those who mocked him and executed him? Of course. But along with that anger, there would have been regret, right? They had, after all, left him, deserted him, denied him. In all of that mix would have been the deep love that they had for Jesus. Grief and regret are meaningful only in the context of love, of deep, significant, life-giving connection. Perhaps gratitude. They had found one another, hadn't they? In community, they could regroup and hopefully move forward. Probably they would have been anxious. Their world had been turned upside down. Questions would have swirled in their minds. What's next? What would tomorrow look like, let alone next week or, or next year? They were in this space of swirling emotions and uncertainty and, and questions about what in the world the future might be and what it might look like. And into all of this that would have been happening inside of themselves, Jesus appears. He just shows up. There's no knock at the door. There's no waiting for a door to be opened. There's no bubble floating down from the sky like Glinda the Good Witch and the Wizard of Oz. He's just all of a sudden there without any warning or any sense that he might be there. And in the middle of all these emotions going on inside the disciples' minds and hearts, Jesus shows up and shares with them a word of peace and invites them, I would guess, to exhale. Like looking through a prism, there are many angles of light and meaning through which we can come to understand this story or these stories that are a part of our scripture today. There's the disciples locked behind closed doors. Twice they're locked in an upper room. They don't seem to get it. There is doubting Thomas who refuses at first to believe. There is the, the commissioning that Jesus gives to them. He breathes on them and says to them, go into the world and be my, uh, share my forgiveness, share my word of life with, with folks. There are so many ways of looking at and understanding all of this encounter. I want to invite us to consider one way of looking at it that might be a little bit different than you may have thought of it before. And this comes from theologian Richard Rohr. In one of his devotions, he writes this, that this encounter between doubting Thomas and the risen Jesus is not really a story about believing in the fact of resurrection. Okay, Whether or not Jesus is raised, that's not what... Thomas seems to be concerned with. Rather, what, what Rohr suggests this might be is a story about believing that someone could be wounded and resurrected at the same time. Do you hear that? Can someone be wounded and resurrected at the same time. And we get a clue about this possibility with the number of times that, that John writes as he's recounting this story that there is a focus on the hands and on the side. Jesus invites, invites uh, Thomas to put his hands in his, in his wounds. Now, you notice as well that Thomas doesn't take him up on that. He does, it doesn't say that Thomas touched, but once he recognized the woundedness of Jesus, 
then he proclaims belief. Is it possible to be both wounded and exhibit new life, resurrection, at the same time? As human beings, it is easy for us to look in the mirror, literally or figuratively, and see only or primarily our woundedness, our hurts, our pains, our griefs, our unfulfilled hopes or desires, our regrets, the times that we've been overlooked at work and that promotion was given to someone else, the bullying we endured or are enduring as a child or a youth, the rejection we maybe have felt by loved ones or family members as they have acted out of their own woundedness. It is, it is easy for us to look in the mirror and see all of those hurting that hurting side of us, that place that feels not whole, that feels pain-filled. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that to be human is to be wounded. And if this story, as Richard Rohr suggests, is at least in part about believing that someone could be wounded and resurrected at the same time, well, for me, that means that this story is not just about Jesus out there somewhere, but it is also about me, and I would suggest it's about you, and it's about us as a community. It's a story about hope, even and most especially when we feel most wounded and most alone. It's about God, a God who has come to us in Jesus and shared our humanness, a God who breaks through our defenses, locked doors, etc., and understands our woundedness. Remember Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15, the writer is talking about Jesus, saying, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who was like us in every way, experienced every temptation, and yet never backtracked or sinned. And then I believe this story of wounded resurrection is not just about me and about making me feel better about myself and about my life, but I believe it is about us and how we live together in such a way that allows our woundedness to become the place out of which we can help one another heal that it is out of our wounded places and spaces in our lives that we can make those deep connections that can set us on a path toward new life. If we are able to get beyond using our woundedness as an excuse to hurt others or belittle them or an excuse to, to not allow ourselves to become all that we are called to become or as a hurdle over which we cannot get beyond, and so we become stuck in our woundedness. And, and I want to acknowledge here that I'm in no way suggesting that this is easy or automatic, that there are some wounds and some woundedness that goes deep and will never heal or be able to go away. But if we are able to view our woundedness as a place out of which connecting to others in a grace-filled space can bring reconciliation and relationship, then we are able to become what Henry Nouwen called wounded healers. As Jesus' wounds created a space in his hands and in his sides within him where he could welcome in the anxieties and the fears of the disciples, inviting Thomas to touch him. And he offers them his peace instead. 
so too can our wounds, your wounds, create a space in us, places of understanding and compassion for those who may be struggling with the same wounds. And in that space, connection can lead to redemption and redemption can lead to new life, resurrection life. Friends, when we look at one another, not through the lens of superiority or judgment, but through a lens of shared woundedness, that is when Christ comes alive and the possibilities open for us. The kingdom of God. And we can begin to make a way for a future that is rich with hope and is grounded in love. I want to read verses 30 and 31 again, the last verses in our, in our scripture reading. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. What I believe this story is hinting at is that that life in his name is not a life that is free from worry or woundedness or anxiety or, or fear or anything else that we might think would exclude us from new life, but that new life in his name is possible through admitting and recognizing all of us are dealing with all of that stuff. And that rather than precluding us and keeping us from being able to experience that new life, those are the doors that open for us the possibility of new life. Perfection isn't the goal. That's not the sign of new life. The sign of new life is recognizing our woundedness and in our woundedness making space for one another and especially those who share in that woundedness. May it be so for each of us and for all of us together. Amen. It is the wounded one that invites us. Are we supposed to sing first? I want to make sure. Yes, no. You didn't get the revised copy. <laughs> We're going to go right into communion. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, it's the wounded one. It's the wounded one that feeds us at the lake shore, um, around tables, um, around our tables as we share in that woundedness together. And so we prepare our hearts um, through um, listening and acknowledging our hurts and pains and bringing them with us and being embraced and welcomed by Jesus. Let us go to God in prayer as we uh, prepare ourselves for communion. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, and join with every creature in heaven and on earth, every creature under the earth and in the sea, to sing your praises. You create all that is, bringing forth goodness and new life. You are at work in our world now, transforming lives, healing brokenness, comforting those who mourn. Your people were not always faithful. 
They followed our, we followed our own desires, lashing out in anger, forgetting those in need. You sent prophets to call them back to your paths, reminding them of your love and telling them to care for one another. You were always faithful, for you loved your people. You gave us Jesus to walk with us and to show us your love. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and taught us your ways. He showed us the abundance of your love and reminded us to share it with others. On the night before his death, Jesus gathered with his followers, telling them to love one another. He shared a meal with them, taking bread and blessing it, breaking it, giving it to them, saying, this is my very being. And when you eat this, remember that I am with you. He took the cup and he blessed it saying to them, this is the cup of forgiveness poured out in abundance for you and for all people. And as you drink this, remember that I am with you. And so we offer our very selves to you with glad and grateful hearts. O God, send your spirit of abundant love upon these gifts from the earth bread and wine. Transform them by the power of your grace into food for our bodies and nourishment for our souls. Send your spirit upon us and transform us by the power of your wisdom that we may become the body of Christ, feeding his lambs and tending to his sheep. All praise is yours, God of power and might, wisdom and honor, glory and blessing. All praise is yours now and forever. Amen. The table is prepared. Um, In a moment, we'll invite those who will be helping to serve to come forward. As you come forward, you are uh, welcome. You'll be handed a piece of bread, and you're invited to take a cup and receive those. Um, If you have desire for or need for uh, gluten-free bread, they are located on the two, near, in front of the two baskets that are at the front of the church. And the baskets are for our Benedict Fund. If you would like to make a, a donation to the Benedict Fund, which helps uh, those in need in our community, um, you may do place that uh, offering in those baskets. Let us receive these gifts from God's love and God's grace.
Stand as you are able as we sing our closing hymn, Christ Has Risen from the Faith We Sing, number 2115. Christ has risen while earth slumbers. Christ is died as he said, as he died, 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 as he this morning or if you still have those fears and anxieties, uncertainties about your life or circumstances that may be around us. Resurrection is a reminder that God dwells with us in the midst of all of that and offers us a small piece of bread and a little bit of wine. It reminds us that God is here. God dwells with us, and that God raises us to new life, as imperfect, as fearful, as anxious as we may be. God is with us and walks with us every step of our lives. Go in peace, as Jesus said, dear friends, amen.